today I want to talk about support vector machines. Uh, just kidding, sort of. What I actually want to talk about is two separate ideas in deep learning, where, and they're both kind of extremes. One is deep learning will solve all of our problems, and the other is deep learning is all hype. No one really holds all of these, and they're both, equal, uh, they're both equally wrong views, and like, there's very much a spectrum, and there's evidence for each of these. And what I want to talk about is not like all of the little evidence that they have for each view, but um, the, hyper the support vectors of the dividing hyperplane. So I don't want to focus on the deep learning slam dunks all the way to the left and the impossible tasks on the right, but more of the evidence that is closest to the boundaries of showing what our current capabilities are, because that's where I think the interesting problems lie. And hopefully by understanding just this subset of the entire field of deep learning, you can have a pretty good approximation how, of how the rest of the space is. Um, since most people I interact with are much more in the deep learning will solve everything camp, I've made my top talk deep learning, modular in theory, and flexible in practice. Uh, feel free to ask questions at any time, especially if it sounds like I'm lying to you. Um, I feel like that's when the, the discussions get really interesting. Everything is going to be kind of sort of true and mostly true, but um, because this is a talk, some things have to be kind of approximations, but very happy to address those. So let's talk a little bit about deep learning. Hopefully most people know about this because I said the prerequisites were kind of advanced. I didn't mention math, but I lied. There's going to be a teensy bit of math, um, but really basic math. So to me, deep learning means op composing optimizable subcomponents, so not necessarily neural networks and matrix multiplications. Um, optimizable roughly means differentiable um, for most purposes. Um, differentiable means you, you can do backprop on this computation graph. Uh, backprop is just the chain rule combined with dynamic programming. And when we get to practical DL, which is very different from like this lofty idea of DL that we have, it's DL as we've described it so far, combined with gradient descent, software, and data. Um, gradient descent is a form of local learning. And when I talk about software, I talk about the commonly used frameworks. Um, Fiano, TensorFlow, Torch, Cafe, MX, Net, Keras, they all are kind of similar in many ways. But I'm, I, they, I think they all have a lot in common as well. So when I talk about them in general, it hopefully should apply to anything that we have currently come up with and many of the new things that we will come up with. So let's talk first about how deep learning is modular. Um, there's definitely some amazing things about it, and it definitely solves some real problems. Everyone's familiar with the ImageNet results. It's 2012 is when it first started, and that's kind of what built the initial DL hype. And it's also been able to like recently get superhuman. And I'm not sure if many people know this, but the 2016 results were released this morning. Um, yet to tell if anything is super duper cool, but it's at below 3% top five error right now, which is quite a big improvement. Especially over, what was it, 25 before deep learning started coming around, and this gets exponentially harder, right? Um, there've been some successes, some moderate successes in um, neural machine translation. So when you take in a sentence of one language and you output a sentence of a different language entirely from a bilingual corpus, there's been the successes playing Atari games from raw pixels. So this is really cool because the sa exact same network architecture was trained to solve, what is that? Is that like 50 tasks? I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot of tasks. And if you see that line, that is the line where the model starts beating humans. So this is in median better than humans, which is a really, really, um, really strong result because like Atari games are made for human understanding, right? There's priors there that humans leverage. Um, there's AlphaGo, which has been like a huge success in reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning because I think people said this was 10 or 100 years off depending on the person, but no one ever expected. Uh, I think a year ago, no one would have expected us to be where we are now. And of course, um, some of our applications are things like finding cancer. It's not limited to just task where you have accuracy though, it can create new works of art. This is an example of Deep Dream, where you kind of stimulate a neural network to amplify its activations and it can create some pretty interesting things. There's neural style transfer where you can modify existing art by taking the style of one um, painting and apply it to a different picture. There is the ability to turn CSI's zoom and enhance into reality via super resolution networks, where you use a network to like kind of fill in the gaps in some plausible manner. There is WaveNet, where you have networks that can generate music or generate speech, and this is 
like in just a single network beating the state of the art in um, text to speech generation. And most importantly of all, we can combine our pictures with that of Pokemon. So clearly the future is here. Um, this, this one uses a slight twist on the neural style transfer, which kind of encourages more local structure. Um, and it can do all sorts of things, right? It can do supervised learning, it can do semi-supervised learning, it can do unsupervised learning, it can do reinforcement learning. Lots of really cool stuff there. It takes in all sorts of data, so as opposed to the rest of machine learning, which is limited to tabular data, it can take in uh, problems with sequences, of inputs, or outputs. It can take in graphs as inputs. It can solve discrete optimization problems, where the problem is to reorder your inputs, and that's actually quite hard. The, this last neural network actually can approximate uh, traveling salesman problem solutions in linear time, which is pretty crazy. Um, and of course, there's these, uh, these things are super cool, really, really interesting. Um, I believe they're called neural module net. The, no one, the, the naming is not consistent, but they're roughly neural module networks or module neural networks, whatever. But the idea here is instead of training a single neural network where you have like all of your pieces connected together, you have a lot of like different pieces. And now that you have an example, you combine your pieces in a certain way such that it fits that example. You train all of these things to uh, each of the components now that it's connected. And then after that example, you break it apart and create new networks every time. And this kind of thing allows you to get like real powerful composability where you can like learn like a dog finding module, a cat finding module, as well as like an orthogonal module to tell like if the question where is answered. And they've used this for both question answering tasks, which are quite hard to do and I believe they've gotten excellent results on, as well as um, reinforcement learning tasks where you learn different modules for each task as well as each robot. So different robots can have like their own motor control where you pass in and they get the inputs of the tasks into some sort of like distributed representation of a goal and process what exactly they're supposed to do. So that is super, like this kind of stuff is really awesome. Um, I'm going to not have a real story right now because I, I think there's some things that I like to nerd out about that other people might appreciate. Um, I'm kind of a computer scientist uh, and the fact that we can implement differentiable data structures to me is just mind blowing and can like enable all sorts of applications. Like anything we'd use with a data structure, maybe we can replace with a neural network, right? Like many people like random forests, but what if we replace the forests with differentiable forests? Like we, we might not need anything except a neural network with these results. And this does this roughly by interpolating between the possible operations you do on the neural network. Uh, another really cool result, which I think is worth mentioning, is on hierarchical recurrent neural networks. So imagine you had a problem um, uh, like a problem with a really long sequence, and this can be very hard to solve because you need to pass through a lot of nodes in order to get to the, you know, from the thing you care about to the thing that caused the thing you cared about. And if you knew the hierarchy in the data, you could hard code the connections in the neural network such that you have like these highway shortcuts here, which basically skip a whole bunch of connections and go straight to the part that you care about. And this can make training much more efficient. It can actually enable some sort of applications and it, can, it, it helps a lot. And the cool part about this network is rather than having to hard code the hierarchy, which is something you don't often have in problems, it allowed to learn the hierarchy at the same time as exploiting the hierarchy. So at the same time, you learn where these boundaries are as well as how to do that well. And what this results in is it, it improves performance, which is, I think, awesome. But the most awesome part about this is now you can apply this to new data sets where you don't even understand what the hierarchy is in the first place. So for text, maybe it's obvious you go from characters to words. Um, after words, it's kind of non-trivial. Maybe even for words, is that, that's the wrong set you want to do like subwords. But what if you wanted to do something completely novel like genomics? People don't even understand genomics. How can, you, how can someone like hard code that hierarchy? And if these things can like discover that structure for us, we actually might be able to learn something more than just making an accurate neural network. So this to me is like a very interesting like, scientific problem that this could solve. And I would going to have a bold claim as well, which is that today's deep learning modules can solve all of our problems if you just ignore the practical aspects, which is data software optimization. So roughly, um, if you gave me a problem, I could probably design a neural network that given some magic parameters probably could solve that problem, um, like a computable one, obviously. Um, and the way you could do this is you could have the sequence to sequence framework for input and output. This allows you to use a recurrent neural network as input and a recurrent neural network as output. And these allow you to both input and output variable length sequences. And you can transform almost any input into a variable length sequence. So this becomes very, very flexible. 
And what you can put in the middle is this kind of new architecture called a neural program interpreter, which, uh, among many other cool things, it allows you to learn subroutines in the neural network and play with pointers. And once you have this kind of thing, you get kind of the power of like a full computer, except now maybe the full computer can learn to do exactly what you want to do. And that is it for the theoretical aspect. So it seems like, wow, these things are super awesome. They can solve anything we care about. We just have to design something flexibly and hope for the best. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And in practice, it's not even close to how things work. I'm going to discuss some of these issues, but let's start with the easiest one, which is data. It all starts with the data efficiency of neural networks, or rather, the lack of. Uh, compared to other models, they are extremely data efficient, which means in order to get the same kind of model, you need a lot more data than other kinds of, um, other kinds of classifiers would require. Some might argue that this is a good thing and, say, and argue that it's a necessary thing. So they might say, flexible models, which is obviously very, very strong. You need flexible models in the first place to even do a lot of these hard problems. Combined with a lack of priors, which is normally seen as a good thing as well. Um, you don't want to hard code the structure of your problem into your neural network because you want to discover that automatically because your prior might be wrong. And you don't want to do that work because that work's no fun. And that kind of necess necessarily leads to data inefficiency. But I don't think that just because it leads to some amount of it doesn't lead to the amount that we have today, which is actually pretty terrible. Um, I think many researchers are suffering from Stockholm Syndrome when they justify this by arguing that if the use case has economic impact, then we just find a way to collect the data set. Because I think there's some problems where there is economic impact, but literally you could collect all the data in the world and it would not be enough. For example, if you want to do binary classification on genomics, um, there, who knows how big the manifold of genomes are, but who knows how much data would it take to discover that. And that just might not be enough because uh, you have like, just a gigantic input space with how large the input sequence is. Um, so that's it for data efficiency. And uh, it's a widely regarded problem. So Joshua Bengio, one of the fathers of this field himself, says that we can do better with less data. And I don't think anyone argues that we're really doing really well on this aspect, even though some might argue that it's not an important aspect. So onto problems with the data we have and that we use. Um, a question many people, I think, get wrong, or maybe I'm wrong, is why do people use ImageNet as a baseline? So some possible answers are A, we think it's representative of all computer vision problems, B, it's a competition, or C, it isn't terrible. Um, many, the correct answers are B and C, but many, many people think it's A, and they, they'd be quite surprised. There's many computer vision problems that are not at all like ImageNet. Um, but the competition aspect is very important because uh, preventing cheating is very important. And in a lot of data sets, when people are given the test sets already, they do a lot of tuning on their test set. So you can't believe a lot of the results that come out, and you just have to kind of believe their story in a way or try it out in yourself in a problem that you care about. And the it isn't terrible aspect, I think, represents a lot of the problem with the data sets that we have today. For example, CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, Pentree Bank. What happens is that researchers don't even pay attention to results from these data sets sometimes because they just mean so little, and the data sets have like, very well-known flaws that people just exploit. They know, like, oh, you don't need this many filters on this problem. All you need to do is regularize it more. So don't even bother with non-regularization tricks. Don't even evaluate your model on this data set because you know you're going to do worse than the existing state of the art. There's a lot of that that goes on in the research community that people just don't see. And it makes things feel artificially better than they are because like, we're making progress all the time in data sets, but it turns out we don't care about that progress and it doesn't apply to anything else. It's just kind of implicitly feed, fitting that data set and you know, getting more papers published. Um, in addition to the data we have that we do use, there's the stuff that we don't use that's even worse. We are currently really bad at leveraging unsupervised data, so data from the same distribution as our, the, a problem we care about, but without the information that we care about. So the idea is that this problem has some structure, it tells about the output space, so perhaps we can leverage this in order to get something that's better. Um, there's multitask learning, which is when you have a bunch of different tasks on similar data that you care about. And the hope would be by doing all these tasks together, you can leverage shared structure and have kind of an effectively larger data set size than in, of any task individually. Um, similar to that is transfer learning, which I do admit is used a lot. Uh, this is when you have a task that you don't care about, but a lot of data, and you use that information to, for a task that you do care about. And I'm 
I have it this here because despite doing this and having quite a few successes, what we do is kind of the dumbest way you can think of, which is like chopping up a network, using that half of the network and sticking another network on top of that, which is just it's very unnuanced and you inherit all the downsides of the original network, which many people, like these things are very computationally heavy, so you might not want to pay that cost every time. And very similar to transfer learning is using the implicit data we have, which I don't think people even acknowledge much. Um, that is the weights and trajectories of every single model we've trained so far. So if we've, we're training a model, um, why would, whoops, if we're training a model, why would we have to like retrain it again? Like we've already trained a bunch of models, they've made a bunch of mistakes, presumably they discovered some information along the way, why do we need to spend three weeks training version two of the model when we sp spent three weeks training version one? So there's a lot of information there that I think that um, people are starting to like get a feel of but not really actively using. And some might argue that we're actually doing these things very well, but by the fact that no one uses these for anything, um, except for transfer learning, um, it shows that it's very lacking because we definitely could use this data for a lot of different tasks. And finally, the data we don't have as far as the data issue. Um, there are many interesting domains that we have little to no data on, especially not publicly available data. I have the benefit of being able to work at a private company where we have our private data sets that are very useful for important tasks, but we had to collect that data ourselves, right? We had to like, you know, ask partners for it, collect it, find, you know, make it better, all of that stuff. And that's just work that not everyone can leverage. And a lot of the times that there are these tasks that could be really valuable, except we don't know if it would work because we don't have any data on it. And the flip side to that is that there's many interesting challenges that we don't measure. And what gets measured gets managed. So there are aspects of neural networks that we think are very good things, and we, you know, we try to get these things, but we don't really quantitatively verify that they have these things. We just qualitatively make a few visualizations, cherry pick them for the paper, and say, our model's the best thing ever because of this picture. Um, and this is, uh, this is just usually problematic. People talk about long-term memory all the time, but all of the tasks for this fall under the bucket of trivial, which goes into the bucket I talked about earlier, of data that we have that no one cares about because it's so trivial that you can do something stupid to solve it, or mixed in with short-term memory. So a lot of tasks that LSTMs are good at, for example, now, they, have, um, they, they don't have like, long-term memory isolated as a component, and some people think that perhaps we can have better architectures for that, except that now we can't measure it. RNNs in general, I, I actually would guess that we wouldn't even use LSTMs anymore if we had a well-rounded way to measure RNN performance. But because we don't, we just stick with a safe bet of like, oh, this is a pretty complicated thing. It can do everything we want. Let's just stick with it because that, that's what everyone else is doing. And that's clearly insufficient. Um, visual attention, I think, is a really important thing for scaling up um, computer vision problems. People are kind of happy with image net size data sets, but people, I guess, forget that the com computation scales like quite poorly with the image size, and ImageNet is like close to our upper bound in the image sizes that we can take, and there are very important domains where um, we would like to use larger images. Medical imaging, for example, x-rays can be quite large, um, satellite imagery. Um, Any time when you're not taking a picture of something, but rather you have a picture of everything, so surveillance is another aspect of that. Um, sometimes uh, the... You, you do need to attend to a subset of the input, but we're just really bad at that, and we don't even know how to measure what's good at that. So, and that really affects development of algorithms. And something that we, you know, we claim to really want, which is hierarchical learning. We think that that's a really good thing. We actually think that this is how deep learning works, but it actually doesn't work at all. Oh, uh, we have no way of measuring that, so we don't know how to know if it works at all. Um, software, I, that's another big issue with deep learning nowadays. It's something that I care very deeply about. This is actually, I was originally going to make my talk entirely on this, but there were some recent developments that came up that made me think that, wow, people are really questioning their assumptions, so maybe we can share some of these questions that um, people have been asking. Um, and when it comes down to it, all of deep learning is computation graphs. Um, this is so that you can do back propagation through that computation graph, so you can roughly see partial derivatives in there. And right now, every single framework uses the simplest way of creating this computation graph which is adding a single node at a time. This means that the amount of work to construct the graph is linear in the graph size, and this can be quite problematic. Um, there are many more interesting ways to create graphs, like recursive relationships, uh, where you like, declaratively say, like, I want this thing 
every x and then do this five times. And that way your work could be logarith logarithmic in the graph size. And this could make it much easier to make these things. And by making it easy, it makes the research actually doable, just because um, th what is done is very much a function of its ease, unfortunately. Um, composability, I think, is a huge issue here. And I mean, as software people, we would know that we don't want to reimplement the same thing over and over and over. But most of the tools are extremely uncomposable. So I don't want to single out this specific library, but it, because this is more of a rule than the exception. But you get a lot of these things where you have a multiplicative integration layer norm, modern RNN, where you have an LSTM Gruel highway with like different modules to include multiplicative integration, which is in an RNN you multiply instead of you add, and layer normalization, which is like batch norm for um, RNNs. And this is, this is quite horrible. Like what happens when you add a new type of cell? You gotta redo everything. What happens when you add a new trick? You're going to have to like multiply all this by two. Um, really problematic design, I think. And I think this is indicative of the tools that we're kind of using because the tools just don't allow us to say like, you know, m just mix in these things really nicely. And I, I know that it's possible. Um, so, so some examples of what good and bad software change for us is that in bad software, I think a telltale sign is that if it's easier to explain in words, or if it's significantly easier to explain in words than in software what the trick is, it's probably a sign that your software isn't necessarily limiting. So if you want to say, like, put, just put this connection here or like, add this to the cost, that seems really simple, right? But then you're like, oh crap, now I need to like, make this pass through like, three different layers of code. That becomes problematic. Um, as opposed to in good software, when it becomes just really easy to try all combinations of all, everything because all those combinations are available to you. And in addition, you're just encouraged to try more things because it's just really easy, as opposed to the very common belie belief of give up, giving up on ideas because they're unlikely to be worth the effort. Or as some other people think, it, they just think, oh, I'll just wait for someone else to do it, and if it's good, then I'll copy them. And what ends up happening is if everyone thinks that, then no one does the thing. And um, another sign of bad software, which I think is obvious to most people who write software, is that everything becomes one-off, which is how research, unfortunately, is. Um, you just write a repo, you've, you know, you've done a lot of work, you've worked a few months on this code thing, you put the repo in GitHub, and then you just say goodbye to the code forever because all of that work was extremely specific to that one trick you did, and none of it's going to be useful to anyone else. As opposed to making it really easy to compose, compose these new tricks together. And I think this really changes the trajectory of research because what ends up happening is everything becomes an independent trick rather than like look at this super cool combination of previous stuff that um, did really well. And arguably some of our biggest breakthroughs have been super awesome combinations of stuff that have done really well. AlexNet, um, the 2012 ImageNet winner, um, combined a bunch of tricks that already existed. Um, you know, like ConvNets, they applied depth, used GPUs, he used Dropout, and all of a sudden he's like, you know, basically changed the entire field of artificial intelligence. Um, and this is the same thing with AlphaGo, right? Like the, the ideas in AlphaGo are pretty basic. If you take a basic RL class, you will think of the exact architecture that AlphaGo has. Um, but like to combine them all together in such a way was actually quite non-trivial. And I, I do think that this is an un underexplored area. So in software, um, some things are just hard. And when I say some things are hard, I mean that some subset of the software we have has some difficulty with it. It's not all the software, but nothing makes everything easy and everything makes at least a few things hard. And this is only a t tiny subset of the things that are hard. So, and not only is this only a tiny subset of the, problem, of the papers that exist that some frameworks just will like, be unhappy with, um, there's also all, all the, the entire space of great ideas that are still in someone's head because it's too, hard, too much work to build. So some basic examples are whenever you have like a, you know, an activation function with a cost, for example, where, what this happens is that sometimes it makes sense to have some extra regularization on certain parts of the network, but many frameworks don't assume like, hey, maybe my activation function adds something to the cost, and now every time you use an activation function, you need like a cost term that you add to some place. And it becomes like kind of weird and confusing. There are nodes with updates. So um, before batch normalization came out, many frameworks assumed that parameters and state were the same thing, and this messed up many things. So if you assume that all state is parameters, then when you calculate SGD, you're doing SGD on the mean and variance terms of batch normalization, which makes no sense. Or if you think that, oh, all state is, sorry, all parameters are state, and then you realize that, oh, I'm going to just serialize all of my state, 
and you realize you didn't, didn't serialize half your network because that stuff kind of stuff's important. And almost every library had this issue, and there was like panic around a year ago when this came out, because it was kind of a big, uh, big achievement. So gradient transformations can be quite hard for some frameworks. Uh, feedback alignment is when you replace the backprop with random matrices, essentially, and gradient noise is simply adding Gaussian noise to your gradient, and these things tricks seem pretty darn simple, but this actually can be very complicated in terms of implementation, and this is very problematic for some networks, uh, for some frameworks. Um, this is something that I, I think is just crazy, because um, drop connect is a trick that's very similar to dropout, um, where instead of dropping out the activations, you drop out the parameters. And it seems much more principled to me, but because it's not implemented as a layer, it's implemented as a transformation of your parameter, basically no one implements it because you can't define it the same way that you can define a layer. You know, like uh, con value dropout, con value dropout. You'd have to like put the dropout somewhere inside the cons that you just don't understand because the software is opaque to you. And what ended up happening is this had similar performance to dropout, but this technique was basically rediscovered two more times in different domains because it turns out that thinking about it from this way is just a much more effective way of thinking about the problem. And dropout doesn't work as well in networks where you have um, shared parameters because you can still learn the codependence when your parameters are shared because you use the parameter somewhere else. Um, modified update rules. This is another thing that Basically, I, I don't know of any framework that allows you to really customize the insides of your update rules, because these are like some of the most like hard-coded things. But there's a trick that involves scaling Atom and SGD by your, an additional gradient term, and this seems to be pretty helpful for some problems. And this is just impossible to do without copy-pasting almost all of the time, and that, that, that's just terrible to me, right? Like, who wants to just copy-paste your code every time you're adding another trick? What happens when there's another trick, right? Um, and this is another really big one. Multi-stage pipelines. Everyone in deep learning hates multi-stage pipelines. I hate multi-stage pipelines. Um, multi-stage pipelines are no fun, they're gross. Um, why not just do it, train everything end to end? But, and like that's, that, that's what I think, and I honestly I still think that because the tools don't make it easy for me, but I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a second. Um, normally in engineering, being able to separate your pipeline is a really, really good thing. You can optimize each independently. You can have different teams working on them. You could cache the results in the middle so you don't have to compute everything again. You can solve what should be easier subproblems because you've designed the easier subproblems. We should love utilizing easier subproblems, right? Like there's some problems that it, this might actually solve like the data dimensionality problem. Um, but then I realized that the reason I feel this way is that this is just, the tools make this just way too hard. If it was as easy as communicating it with a person, pre-train all of this with a uh, convolutional autoencoder and then try it. Um, I would definitely try this all the time because there's lots of problems I have where I think that maybe this might be helpful and if it was easy enough for sure I would do it. But because it's not, like just no one does it and I think that's, this is actually why we see so little of this and whenever we do see some of this, basically no one adapts it except if they use their exact code. So some people do faster RCNN, I think they mostly use the exact same code that was, it was released with or a fork of it. Um, I, I keep think this is horrible because uh, one of my principles is the tools you use shouldn't limit the way you think, but today's tools are extremely limiting. Um, I've designed and implemented many different deep learning libraries to explore that trade-off space, and I know we can do better, and I do think that we will, just because as the field is growing, more and more people with software engineering backgrounds are flocking to DL because this is like the new hip cool thing, um, which it is, and notes saying, Wow, I come from software and all this is terrible. Let's, let's make it better. And it's true, right? Um, it's gonna happen. I, I expect like in about a year, we will have like real software engineered libraries and TensorFlow is a little bit of this, right? It's like kind of Google engineers saying, how did research even run on these frameworks for like the last five years? Let's give an, you know, like a real engineering push to it and it seems to be helping. I don't think TensorFlow is perfect, but it seems to be a good step in the right direction. There's definitely good ideas there. Okay, let's get to a much harder topic, which is optimization. Optimization of what we do is all local learning, and I think it's an open question how we learn complicated things. I think that we all want to learn kind of cool, complicated things. Some might argue that we do learn complicated things, like AlphaGo, that seems pretty complicated. But um, I think the way Andre Carpathy described this is something that like everyone in the field was thinking 
but not really, didn't really have a good way to say, which is that all of deep learning nowadays is just doing memorization and instead of thinking. And what we really want is we want models that think. Instead of just being like, here's this exact pattern that I saw, like this pattern appeared in this data set, therefore I think this is it. And that's why we get like really stupid examples sometimes of our continents. Like they do amazing at tasks of like determining like which of like the 10 breeds of dogs this one dog is. But sometimes you get something completely wrong. And that's just, that can be an unacceptable failure case, especially when you need to, like you need really good predictions. Um, exploration of the parameter space is really important because if you assume you're doing local learning all the time, how do you explore that space, right? And local learning also has a slight side effect for um, computational expense because differentiability has to be, um, sorry, for, for example, let's have a network that uses memory. And using, a me using memory is really cool because you can like, have a lot more information than like, what's hard coded into your network. The downside about this is that since you want it differentiable, you want everything to be kind of soft and smooth. And because you want something smooth, you don't want to cut things off at zero or one. And because you don't cut things off, you basically, when you're like trying to access a memory location, rather than just accessing one or a few, you end up accessing all of them, at least a little bit. And this is how like the gradients work, because you have that smooth transition of whether or not you look at something. And this is very powerful, because it learns how to do this, but it like kind of puts an upper bound in the kind of problems that we can do this on. And um, if, we, if we're going to solve general AI, which I'm not saying we will, um, that we, we can't have those kinds of upper bounds, like simple n squared bound, that, that's just too much. Um, exploration is huge. It's not just a problem for reinforcement learning. Um, optimization can get networks stuck, and trajectories of like how the network learns over time is actually extremely important. Uh, this lack of exploration probably affects, uh, negatively affects every neural network, but it's really hard to measure, so it's hard for me to make any claims about. Um, it's also hard for you to disprove me, so um, there we go. But it's especially noticeable in certain modular architectures. For example, spatial transformer networks, they use this network to localize the input first, and then they zoom into that input, and they use like a much bigger classification network in order to do that. And this gets you a lot of computational, um, it makes it much more computationally efficient, because rather than using this big expensive classification network on all of the input, you only do it on a subset. Um, and what ends up happening is that whether or not like which of these two networks converges first um, changes the, the solution you end up in. So for example, if you train the localization network too quickly, you end up learning how to, if you end up training the classification network too quickly, you end up learning how to classify things um, on like the really big images because you haven't had time to slowly zoom into the correct thing. And what this ends up happening is you're in kind of a local maxima where because you're, the downstream thing is really good at classifying big things, you never, you're, you never have a reason to zoom into the small thing and you never get those benefits. And it's the same thing if you learn the localization network first, you might learn garbage because your classifier is garbage and you just zoom into complete garbage because that works some of the time better than random. Um, it's a same, similar thing for generative adversarial networks where you have like these two networks playing in kind of a game and of like one trying to trick the other. And if one of them gets into like a bad location, all of a sudden, now the other network can't really like save itself because of these issues. Um, and there's other examples of this where this is, there's this recurring theme of just because it can work doesn't mean it will. My colleagues and I had a paper, ResNet and ResNet, which did a bunch of work trying to get networks that can learn to choose between residual networks and CNNs. And it was fairly difficult to design an architecture that could learn to do that. Uh, it was very easy to design architecture to learn to do that, but it was very hard to get one that actually worked. So this is kind of an issue. Something that I'm really excited about here, though, is a paper that I've worked on, which um, is taking advantage of these trajectories and creating neural networks that change over time, going from easy to optimized to difficult. And this kind of like teaches your difficult optimized components, like, hey, you should follow this easy thing. It's probably doing the right thing because it has like a less flexible prior. Um, and a common argument is, what about non-local learning? And the answer is it doesn't work. Um, it works much worse than any time you can use differentiable stuff. And this is an example of a paper that um, is basically negative results, <laughs> but yet was not treated that way. Um, cool. And last topic, which is very, very important for the practitioner, is understanding. So this is a list of practically useful DL theory. Uh, there's none of it. Um, so there currently isn't any theory to help us answer any of the really hard questions and guide us. So basically all of our experiments have to be done, sorry, all of our 
you know, all of our guidance has to be done via experiments and guesswork. And this is really problematic because we want generalization. Everyone wants generalization. No one cares about not generalization because that's the only thing that matters. And generalization is this a very lofty concept that doesn't, it's not really something you can quantify. And it just happens to happen in deep learning and we don't really know why. Um, and to know something is generalizable, we need to understand what it is. You know, we need to understand it and how it interacts with things around it, right? So that, so that we can know when to apply it. Like, what are the pros and cons of this activation function? Activation functions are probably the simplest thing to do here. And like, we just don't know the pros and cons of any activation function. Um, and since we can't do that, what we end up doing is we try it on several tasks, see what sticks, and try to convince other people to use our thing. And the result of this is we never know when something will work, which is really crappy. Um, and we actually don't really know how anything really works. Um, some examples are batch normalization. There's just so many things in there that like, people pretend to have a story for, but like, that story is incomplete. There's some regularization effect, because you use batch statistics, so that's kind of noise. There's normalization. This results in scale independence. They might help with vanishing and exploding gradients. It implicitly bounds your activations as well. Everything is dependent on batch size. So like, new, normally, batch size is just to change how fast you converge, but now it changes a lot of different things. And basically, all test time approximations are wrong. But some are better than others, depending on the data sets. So you just have to try them. And like, that's just a horrible scenario. Um, I'm going to skip additive gradient noise, because I think I'm running low on time. But hierarchical learning is a, another really important topic that we think deep learning works via hierarchical learning. See this little picture? I'm sure everyone has seen a picture kind of like this before. It's like a very, really cute story. Um, you, know, you start with pixels. You can learn edges from pixels. And from edges, you get corners. From corners, you get object parts. Then you get like bigger object parts, and you get objects, and like this is all like really awesome story. People are like, yeah, let's apply deep learning to everything. This makes sense. Why would we hard code this? And it turns out that um, some of the best re researchers think that this story is not the reason why deep learning works. It's actually I, I I don't doubt that this is what is done, but it might be more of an accident because we kind of expect to see this, so we design architectures that kind of see this. But it might not be the reason for the success. And you can actually see this with um, residual networks with stochastic depth. So what it is is that you have like this identity path where every now and like you randomly um, have a network that you apply to the, the results and add it back into this identity path. And this behaves completely not consistently with this hierarchical learning representation because it basically puts everything in the same hierarch hierarchical level. And because it's stochastic, which one's fire? anything could take anything else as input with some probability. And this makes people now think more that maybe congenets work more like a, a bag of features with like really powerful, expressive, mixed features. And we just like consistently like run the same function over it and add more and more to this feature representation. So I'd expect to see more work from that coming soon. And like ResNets beat CNNs, and perhaps maybe even our priors of how CNNs work are holding them back. So this is, we have yet to see that, but that's just, that's just crazy to me. Um, we can't answer some of the big questions. So how to know which problems are solvable, that's a really important question because it takes a lot of time to know if you can solve it. And even if you don't solve it, who knows if someone else can. Um, we really want to know the answer to this question, but we don't. We don't know how much data is needed. So if you fail, is it because you have not enough data and will like, you know, epsilon more data, like just like set you past the plateau and like make everything work? And we don't know how to construct architectures and set hyperparameters. And I think Andre has some great advice on this, which is if you want to solve, get an architecture for a task, don't be a hero. Um, find something that works, use it, optionally tweak it, don't change it much. Um, because that thing seems to work together and we don't really know why. Um, there are, these architectures are created through a lot of work, tons of trial and error. You basically like fork existing architectures that like have tricks added to them, but like slight, slight tweaks of hyperparameters, which are basically overfit for any competitive task, but you need to fork them because then you won't get competitive results and then no one will listen to you. Um, and we don't understand like which of these tweaks changed it or which ones interact with each other. So it's all a really bad state of affairs. Um, there's hyperparameter optimization. Um, automatic hyperparameter optimization doesn't give us understanding of the problem space, it just t shows us the problem space. And um, it doesn't really solve our problem. And something that my colleagues and myself have worked on, and actually I think they're presenting tomorrow, is something called genetic architect, where we use 
um, sequential hyperparameter optimization to use hyperparameter optimization in an inner loop to discover which things are important. But then we use like human priors to kind of guide that thing in order to like see like, okay, this is what interacts with this and like start from the most important things and go all the way down because hyperparameter optimization is very good at finding the most important things. Um, so yeah, it's overall not a very good state of affairs. Um, I guess I'll leave you with some wisdom, which is a rule of thumb of mine. So if someone is sure about something in deep learning, then they are wrong. Um, there's a bit of irony in that, so I have a slightly expanded version, which is, except if it's about not knowing something, which is a little closer but not quite there, um, because um, you can also know that something did work that one time. Um, so overall, it's a highly empirical field. Everything's tangled with everything else. The simplest trick can change everything, and we don't know how it behaves. We don't understand. It's incredibly nuanced, but when it works, it works incredibly well, so we still use it. Um, the good news is all of this is solvable-ish. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Any questions? I don't know if we have time. I have negative two minutes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, there's a lot to deep learning that I didn't talk about, and deep learning is actually very, very good at interpretability compared to most machine learning models. There's a lot of things that you can do to tweak the insides of a deep learning model in order to show why it classifies things. Um, so that is one aspect of it. Um, I think it's actually very similar to self-driving cars, and I think it will be solved in a similar way, which is that you're going to need to be significantly better in order to show that like, it's basically immoral not to do this. Um, and after like, people start getting used to this, it's going to be used for much more domains, even in those domains where you're just not significantly better. Like all things in deep learning, it's more complicated than that. The idea is that your architecture is tuned to everything else that's around it. So like if you have a random forest, you're not going to tune it much. It's like it's a random forest. But your architecture is tuned to everything. So if you've tuned your architecture to a certain data set size, um, you will not get benefits from that. But if you tune your architecture to a smaller data set size and you increase the data, you might see no benefits because you've been tuned to that size, right? Like you've implicitly regularized it such that it works for that. So it's kind of very hard to know um, uh, what, what the right size is because you have that, that dual optimization problem, like data versus architecture, right? Um, anything that you want to change the architecture of, um, which is right now most of deep learning is something that you want to customize, to my knowledge. Um, there might be some domains where um, the vanilla model is, gets you really good bang for the buck. For example, if you're doing a, a text task, for example, an um, LSTM with pre-trained word vectors is a, it's like, it's a very strong baseline. So if you did use that strong baseline, you can kind of get close to something static there and like now you can control your variables. But then there's lots of implicit hyperparameters there as well, like how big of a model you do and that's always going to be a choice. So there's no easy answers, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, time, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>